Welcome to Airmanship uh, 2.0 and who's behind it. This is the first in a series of five webinars that are going to talk about Airmanship 2.0. I'm Dave Cook. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Airmanship Excellence and I'd like to thank you for being here this evening. Let me give you a quick check out on the panel. Uh, if you want to minimize the uh, control panel you have there, just click on that little uh, white arrow in the orange rectangle and click on it again to expand it. Uh, I have everybody's uh, mics muted right now uh, just to avoid any feedback problems. Uh, we'll try here again in just a little bit, see if uh, you guys can transmit to me. And you can see here, uh, there is a button to click for mic and speakers on your end uh, versus the telephone. Well, as I'm sure you've already noticed, this is a PowerPoint presentation, but uh, that doesn't mean you can map this uh, program on. You're going to get one knowledge credit. And the sponsors of this uh, are the FAA Safety Team, the FAST Team, and the Friendship Excellence. I was going to hope to share with you folks uh, this evening a little bit about each other. And I was hoping you'd tell me these kinds of things about yourself. Well, I'm going to try one more time here and just see if you work. we've got two-way communications. Mark, I've uh, opened up your mic. Well, I apologize. I'm still not getting anything from you, Mike. Uh, this is unusual. I think the setup is right. I do a lot of these online meetings, a lot of webinars. And I can't tell where the setup is wrong at all, but you know this is cyberspace, so uh, you know, maybe it's something in the uh, GoToMeeting system. So I apologize. We'll skip by this one. Now the series of five webinars uh, talking about Airmanship 2.0, uh, of course, include this first one, who's behind it. Then the second one, we're going to talk about Airmanship 2.0, which is Airmanship 1.0. In the third webinar, we'll talk about your personal Airmanship 2.0 development plan. In the fourth one, we're about which aircraft to fly, how to fly, and to pursue airmanship 2.0. And the fifth and final webinar, we'll, uh, we'll talk about why you do airmanship 2.0 and how to get it. So let's start out by uh, looking a little deeper in, into who's behind airmanship 2.0. Because airmanship 2.0, as you'll see, is a new thing. It's a new paradigm. And uh, I think you should know, it's only right, uh, you should know who's behind it, who put this all together. Because some of the things you're going to hear uh, as you go through these series about Airmanship 2.0 might seem a little radical to you, might seem impossible to you, might seem like something that will never happen. Uh, so I think that you know, for you to have an open mind and consider all these uh, ideas seriously, you need to know who's behind it so that you can make a judgment as to whether or not you know, we're worth listening to. So I'm going to tell you about who we, when I use the term we, who we are. And then I'm going to give you some more specifics on my background. Uh, and of course, you can find more specifics on everybody's background on the website, uh, the Center for Airmanship Excellent website. We'll talk more about that. Uh, then we'll talk about our partners, Center for Airmanship Excellence, and we use that acronym CFAE. And we'll talk uh, about the history of CFAE, as brief as it is. Now, we're going to be using this term, Airmanship 2.0, throughout this series. And again, it's a new term. If you haven't been uh, uh, attending webinars uh, and briefings we've been giving on Airmanship 2.0 in the recent uh, past, uh, you're not familiar with this term. Nobody is. It's a term that we coined. But it's really like a branding for all of everything we're going to talk about. It's a shorthand. It's an easy way to, to identify what it is we're talking about. So I like to think of it as branding and modern marketing terms. And uh, that uh, included in that uh, term, Airmanship 2.0, uh, is this, a safety culture. And it has to be a formal safety culture, not just a plaque on a wall saying safety culture. So that's part of what Airmanship 2.0 is. Airmanship 2.0, uh, another part of it is uh, an Airmanship Development Support Organization. Membership 2.0 requires you to operate within a flight organization and talk about what and that's part of the brand. Also, part of the brand is a formal safety management system. Flying under the principles of membership 2.0 means that you're flying with a formal safety management system. 
so that you're flying modern aircraft and all the safety features are going to be able to now. And that you have a personal airmanship development plan. That's a core principle of Employo. Now, uh, I would suggest that you want to know a lot more about airmanship you know, that we're going to be able to talk about in the evening. Uh, that you go to the uh, website for the Center for Airmanship Excellence, and that uh, website is airmanshipexcellence.org. And when you go there, uh, you can see there are a lot of things you can uh, uh, look at on the site, but I would particularly direct your attention to Airmanship 2.0. If you uh, click on that menu selection, you'll go into a subweb, as we call it, on Airmanship 2.0. And on that subweb, you'll have uh, options uh, that you can look at briefings on who we are in much more detail than I'm going to talk about in this briefing. Uh, you'll find out a lot more about Airmanship 1.0, what we call Airmanship 1.0. Airmanship 2.0, the current airmanship model, which is part of Airmanship 2.0, and as I mentioned, that personal airmanship development plan, which is a uh, core uh, principle of Airmanship 2.0. Talk about those technically advanced aircraft, those modern aircraft. Got a briefing on learning to fly the Airmanship 2.0 way. A uh, good briefing on Airmanship 2.0 support. Again, uh, if you're going to practice Airmanship 2.0, you have to do it within an organization. You need support. You can't do it by yourself. And then uh, we have a briefing on why you need Airmanship 2.0. A uh, briefing on uh, what we affectionately refer to as an ADSOT, you know, association you have to have an acronym. And that stands for Airmanship Development Support Organization Demonstrator. So that's the organization that we're going to send up here in the Chicago area uh, that will support those of us who are pursuing Airmanship 2.0. We also have a briefing, uh, actually any page right now, a video briefing is coming soon. For flying partners, those folks who fly with us, uh, we're pilots, those are, you know, a lot more about what they really should know, personal survival, uh, and feeling a lot better about going to fly with us, uh, a lot of information for them there. And then also where well, you can apply to for sitting outside, but first before you're going to uh, click on that button, you know, I'm sure you're going to want to know a lot about Airmanship 2.0 and what we're doing, and here's where you find all that out. It's Airmanship 2.0 subway. But if you can't find what you look for there, or if I did a uh, question and certain topics or two things, Click on that info and it gives you all of our content. I can let someone give you a phone call. Uh, we want to talk with you about it. We want to make sure you understand Airmanship 2.0. Now, if you, for example, were to click on the uh, who, we, who We Are button, that's what we're talking about here in this briefing. But again, it's uh, we have a longer briefing on the website. You see that there's actually two video briefings, part one and part two. And that was just to keep each one short enough to uh, so you can view them at different times without taking too much time. These, uh, if you click on these pictures, uh, you go to a uh, Windows Media uh, player, and we, we know that some browsers uh, can't play a Windows Media player. So if your browser can't support it, just click here, and you'll go to a, a, a Flash player, which everyone should have a Flash player on their computer. Uh, it works fine. It's just that the picture is a little better if you have a Windows Media player. All right, well, let's get into the meat of it here, who we are. Let me start with the Center for Airmanship Excellence Board of Advisors. We have a board of advisors of, of primarily senior aviators uh, who have been practicing professional pilots uh, for the most part, few, a couple of exceptions, and uh, but that know a lot about what uh, Airmanship 2.0. Uh, and I am the, as I mentioned in the beginning, the executive uh, director of the Center for Airmanship Excellence, and I, I've been around the business for, been flying professionally, I've uh, been a manager, entrepreneur in aviation now for almost 50 years, over 46 years. And uh, I'm going to, I've got a lot more information about me later in the briefing uh, so that we can get into more detail. Uh, if, if you don't want to get into that much detail, then uh, it's a good time for a coffee break. But uh, I'll put off telling you more about me until we get to, to that part of the briefing. Another one of our advisors is Captain Dave Greenberg. Dave also has been in aviation for almost 50 years. Started out uh, in general aviation as a young guy in college. Uh, ended up uh, going into the Air Force, uh, became an Air Force pilot, an instructor pilot in the Air Force. After he left the Air Force, Dave uh, went to work as a line pilot for Delta Airlines and then went into the training center for Delta, uh, did a lot of work with the Airline Pilots Association when he was with Delta, and then uh, Dave uh, eventually worked his way up to Senior Vice President of Flight Operations for Delta Airlines. Dave, like many of us, uh, uh, 
of our generation took an early retirement uh, from Delta in the mid-90s, set up his own consultancy, aviation consultancy, of course, uh, and took on a consulting project over in uh, Korea where he was essentially the, the chief operating officer of Korean Airlines. And he helped uh, Korean Airlines to do a pilot culture change there that was significant and, and made their pilots much safer, made them fly, uh, or allowed them to fly in an airmanship 2.0 way. So uh, that's germane to what we're doing here with the Center for Airmanship Excellence. Uh, Dave has also uh, he also founded and was the CEO of Cargo 360, which is a 747 cargo airline. Also on our board of advisors, uh, Dr. Frank Bacon, uh, Professor Bacon. He's a professor emeritus of marketing and supply chain management at Michigan State University. Uh, he's the originator of a, a process called planned innovation that's been around now for well, over 30 years that has been used by a lot of the Fortune 500 companies here in the United States, a lot of uh, international companies uh, with high success rates in, in uh, making uh, new products and services successful when they're innovations in, in particular marketplaces and across a broad, broad spectrum of uh, industries, including aviation. Uh, Frank has been a pilot for about 50 years now. He, when he uh, was uh, working in his consultancy for a number of years. He had his own King Air that he personally flew along uh, with his partner who was a, a former World War II P-38 pilot. And they got training at flight safety. They got professional training while they were flying the King Air. Frank, uh, Frank still flies. He flies his Archer for personal transportation now, not for business transportation. Uh, and Frank has been a, a great help to us in designing our programs, making sure that we analyze them properly and that they're going to do what we need them to do. Dave Shadle has been flying uh, for over 50 years now. Started out uh, back in 1958, which you'll see was the year I started flying. Uh, but here's Dave's Wright Brothers plaque for uh, over 50 years as a pilot. And he was a uh, FAA operations inspector uh, at the DuPage FISDO for a lot of years and retired about 10 years ago. He's still active. Uh, by uh, serving as a designated pilot examiner at DPE, very active at DPE. And he's also a lead rep for the FAA's safety team. Dave has been very helpful in, in helping us design our, our training programs, our setting our standards for uh, all of our qualifications, uh, and uh, being he's very in touch with the current uh, cadre of personal flyers. And our Final advisor on our board is Captain Arnie Quast. Arnie's been flying professionally now for over 25 years. Started out in general aviation as a young guy. Went to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Uh, graduated from there with all of his certificates. And uh, went to work for United Airlines. And Arnie uh, has been a captain there for a while. He's flying A320s now. Uh, Arnie is uh, very active in what I would call airmanship 2.0 things at the airline. Uh, in working on airline pilots association committees and uh, committees and, uh, and joint projects with United Airlines. Arnie is also a very active personal flyer. He flies general aviation aircraft, does a lot of instructing in the personal flying area, uh, and is very active in the general aviation community, uh, in particular in his EAA chapter, Young Eagles program. Uh, but he works with a lot of young folks, very active in personal flying. Now, the Center for Airmanship Excellence has uh, currently four standing committees. First one is the Training Operations Committee. That's, uh, that committee oversees all the development of all the training programs that are used in Airmanship 2.0 and also the Airmanship Development Plan. Heading up the Training Operations Committee is Captain Bill Brand. Bill uh, retired from United Airlines in 2004. Bill had a very unusual airline career uh, due to the fact that, uh, that he hit the, his airline, uh, first hired airline, uh, right around the beginning of deregulation and uh, picked the wrong airlines. I, I use that term facetiously because we don't, airline pilots in rare cases uh, uh, select their own airline. It's usually you go to work for the airline that first offers you the job. 
but uh, Bill had the uh, privilege, I guess, or the unique experience, or unusual experience, not unique, there are a couple other guys that had the same problem Bill had, uh, of uh, working for six or seven different airlines in his career. And you go to work for one and they go out of business or merge and you go with another. But that's, uh, I think, excellent for Bill's role with us because that gave him a broad range of, of seeing how various Airmanship 2.0 groups operate. Uh, he also uh, worked in the training departments for several of those airlines, which again uh, gives him great qualifications to head up our training operations committee. Bill also, uh, after he retired from United Airlines, didn't let any uh, moss grow on him. He went to Emory Riddle and got his master's degree in aeronautical studies with an area of emphasis in aviation education. So Bill is up to speed in all of the leading edge uh, training uh, techniques and technologies and methodologies uh, that are in the industry right now. For example, uh, FITS, FA industry training standards, uh, part 141 approved school uh, standards, uh, and all the new training techniques that are used in aviation training. Our Flight Operations Support Committee uh, oversees the development and operation of our Flight Operations Support Center. And we use those, uh, uh, that center, we call it an ops center, as part of uh, Airmanship 2.0. It's a critical part of it. And uh, headed, heading up that committee is John Kuiper. John's been flying since the early 70s. He's a private pilot, now working on his instrument rating. Uh, his uh, brother is a professional corporate pilot, long-time professional. Uh, John has a real strong background in aviation or, uh, flight operations management and uh, IT systems, uh, customer support. Uh, all of those things are involved in that ops center. And our fourth standing committee is the, I'm sorry, I'm going ahead of myself, our third standing committee is the Safety and Standards Committee and uh, the SSC develops and oversees the safety cultures, safety management system that we use in Airmanship 2.0, uh, helps to set the standards for qualifications, maintain those standards. Big job. Uh, heading up that committee is Captain Rich Sternel, which uh, is an early retiree from American Airlines after about 22 years there, captain for American. Before that, uh, he, he was a Bush pilot, and before that, he was an aeronautical engineer for Boeing, working on the 747 program. So Rich has the uh, attitude, the personality, and the background for the kind of guy that we want to head up our Safety and Standards Committee. And now our fourth and final standing committee for the time being is the Airmanship Outreach Committee. And the Airmanship Outreach Committee has uh, develops and oversees the operation of our Airmanship Outreach Program. We've just launched uh, our Airmanship Outreach Program a couple of weeks ago, and there's a briefing about that on the uh, airmanshipexcellence.org website that uh, you can get all the information on that if you'd like to take a closer look at it. Uh, heading up that committee is James Binder. Uh, James has both a, a bachelor's and a master's degree in aviation management from Lewis University right here in Chicago area. He also has a private file certificate and instrument rating and he's an FAA uh, certified dispatcher. Uh, he's also worked uh, closely over the years with the Lewis University flight teams, and he is uh, currently a flight dispatcher for United Airlines. Now, in addition to our board of advisors and our standing committees, uh, we have some other crew members with us. We have mentor pilots. Uh, everybody that operates under Airmanship 2.0 will have a mentor pilot. Uh, but these are not casual mentor pilots. They've been trained. Uh, there are systems that they use uh, to mentor everybody. So we have mentor pilots that are volunteers with us right now. Uh, we have other committee members in addition to the chairs of the committees. We have airmanship ambassadors who are out uh, working a, a central part of our airmanship outreach program by briefing the airport communities and the communities around airports that uh, will operate from uh, when we stand up our airmanship 2.0 uh, Airmanship Development Support Organization Demonstrator. We also have senior instructors who so will be a critical part of the training programs involved in Airmanship 2.0 and associate instructors. And of course we have support staff 
ground support staff, uh, uh, that uh, management, uh, business management support staff, folks that are, are pilots and not pilots. And we also have partners, but notice I put that uh, word partners in uh, quotation marks because these aren't partners in the formal business sense. They're partners in the sense that we're all working together uh, to try to make uh, personal flying better uh, for us all in the U.S. One of our partners is the Federal Aviation Administration. We're working with both the FAA WINGS program and the FAA Aviation and Aerospace Education program, doing various things with them. Of course, this uh, webinar is part of the FAA WINGS program, uh, our partnership with them there. Uh, and for example, on the Aviation Aerospace Education uh, program front, uh, we're launching next month. Uh, the Center for Airmanship Excellence is sponsoring uh, the National Association for High School Aviation Clubs. And uh, we're working with the FAA Aviation Aerospace Education Program folks on that. We're also uh, working with Southern Illinois University Carbondale, where you probably know they have a very active aviation program, Ditto Lewis University, and uh, Kishwaukee College, which is a junior college out in Malta, Illinois, has a very active aviation program. Another one of our partners is Women in Aviation International, and that's the Chicago chapter. I just wanted to give you a little bit more background here on, on our FAA partner. Because, you know, when you're dealing with a big bureaucracy like that, partnering with them, trying to go down the uh, uh, parallel path to the same goal, uh, you know, you have to be uh, keeping your eye on what the leadership of that bureaucracy is saying. And, of course, the, the relatively new uh, FAA administrator is Randy Babbitt. Randy was, is a former Eastern pilot, a former president of the Airline Pots Association. Randy and I are contemporaries in that part of our uh, careers. Uh, I can't say that I know Randy well, but uh, we, we come out of the same background there. And uh, here's what Randy's been saying about what we call Airmanship 2.0. Uh, the shared vision that brings us together uh, is that safety is not a program, but a culture. I think, you know, a lot of us have been thinking over the years, the last 30 years or so, that you know, safety is a program, but it's really not. It's a culture. It's a safety culture, and that's really a, a, a one of the bedrock, uh, I'm sorry, one of the cornerstones of Airmanship 2.0 is operating within a formal safety culture. Uh, Administrator Babbitt also says compliance is not enough. They, there, there's, I just read this morning where as pilots we have to com be compliant with around 700 FARs. Uh, that seems like a lot, uh, but you know, uh, this was in uh, Flight Training Magazine, so it's probably fairly accurate. Uh, but even though uh, we have all of those regs to give us guidance and pretty tight guidance in most areas, that's not enough. Uh, there's a lot more to this airmanship, a lot more to being safer and being a better pilot than just complying with the regs. Also, uh, Administrator Babbitt says we need to step above and beyond where we are today. Where we are today is pretty much where we've been for the last 30 years in personal flying in terms of airmanship and our safety record and how things are going. And uh, here Administrator Babbitt is saying we've got to do better. We've got to, we've got to change what we're doing. We have to do something different because what we haven't been doing or what we have been doing has not been working. And by the way, what that is is more. It isn't just continuing to talk about it. It isn't just the, uh, those of us who are personal flyers attending uh, WINGS program webinars and seminars. It's not just uh, you know, go, uh, viewing uh, Air Safety Institute uh, webinars. You know, we have to do all of that, but it's not just that. Uh, we have to do a lot more than what we're doing today. Uh, and Administrator Babbitt says the only way we can do that is to adopt the voluntary programs that will give us the data we need to connect the dots. Let me break that down a bit. Voluntary. Uh, I think what uh, Administrator Babbitt is signaling here is they're not, the FAA is not ready to regulate uh, this area, our personal flying, to the point that it would need to be regulated to make it as safe as it should be. That's what 
those regulations are in place at the airlines, and that's why the airlines are as safe as they are. Now, those same kind of regulations could be imposed on us. But, uh, and I don't know if the FAA would ever do that or not, but I, I think that per, uh, Administrator Babbitt is sending a clear signal to us that we need to adopt voluntarily the programs that are going to do this for us. Now, the, the second part of that statement is the programs that will give us the data we need to connect the dots. And the programs that I believe he's talking about there are the Airmanship 2.0 programs of safety management systems, safety culture, training systems, attitudes, how we look about airmanship, to connect all these dots that are already out there. There's nothing new that has to be invented. All the dots are floating around out there. We just have to connect them as personal flyers to make them work for us. So I had a, a opportunity here for questions and comments. Again, I apologize. It looks like uh, the audio isn't working, but I'm going to give this one more try. Uh, Mark and Robert, I, let's try two of you. I opened up your mics. Can either one of you hear me? This is Mark. I can hear you. Mark, hey, that's great. I don't know how what was happening. Robert, can you hear me? Okay, still not getting anything from, from Robert. Uh, Mark, do you have any questions or comments? No, I think this has been informative. I'm just, you know, here to, to see what you guys are up to. I, I will tell you, I'm a student pilot, an old student pilot, uh, with about 22 hours and 97 landings and takeoffs. So this is kind of new to me, uh, but it's an interesting way of, of looking at flying, and I like it. Great. Hey, when did you start flying? Uh, it was about a year ago. I've been away from it for about seven months because of some other commitments that I've had. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm learning in a 152. I fly out of a, uh, a local airport, uh, Westosha, up mm -hmm. here in Wisconsin. I remember their flying club. Great. Well, good. Well, I'm glad to have you here. And I, I, I know that uh, a lot of this information is going to be new to you tonight because it's been new to all the guys like you I've been talking to for the last year. So thanks for coming. All right. Uh, so I, I said earlier that I would give you more background on my uh, flying career. And I know some people like to hear these war stories from us old guys about what kind of flying we did, and other people couldn't care less. So if you're, if you're one of the former, you know, fasten your seatbelt, I'll give you a quick pass through my career. And if you're one of the latter, you couldn't care less, this is a good time to go get a refreshment. It would take about five minutes to get through this section. Well, I've been a uh, general aviation pilot for uh, about 48 years. I actually took my first lesson 53 years ago in 1958, as I mentioned earlier, the same year that Dave Shadel started flying. Uh, I was 11 years old, and uh, my first flight was actually a flying lesson that my grandmother and my uncle arranged for me. My uncle had just gotten his private pilot license uh, back in 1958. And uh, they arranged for me to actually get a fly list because they knew I was crazy about flying. I always was saying I wanted to be a pilot. And the kind of neat part about it was that my grandmother had never been off the planet before, and she came along in the lesson in the back seat of this tripacer that we used for my first lesson. But I had a great time. I loved it from the, you know, from the first minute. I had a big grin on my face, and I've loved it ever since. That same week, after uh, a couple days later, uh, went down, or my uncle took me up in his interstate L6 that he owned, and uh, gave me a, you know, he was a private pilot, so he couldn't give me any formal flying lessons, but he sure could, uh, you know, let me fly the airplane and tell me what he knew, and so I had about three or four or more hours that, that week flying uh, in his airplane. So that, of course, just cemented totally uh, my uh, desire to become a pilot, and after that point, I never looked back. I was focused on becoming a professional pilot. Uh, flew through high school, got real serious my last couple of years of high school, earned all my money to learn to fly, uh, working down at the grocery store part-time, and I bring that up for you young folks. Uh, you know, flying seems expensive, it is expensive, but it's you can find a way to afford to learn how to fly. And uh, so by the time I graduated from high school in 1965, I had all my professional certificates uh, that I could get. Uh, flight instructor, of course, and I started flight instructing right away uh, at what is now Schaumburg Airport. Back then, it was called Roselle Airport, 
in Piper Colts. And uh, they were brand new airplanes, they're pretty much brand new at the time, that's how we did it back then. Uh, flight schools would get pretty much new airplanes, fly them for a year or so, sell them off, get new airplanes. And, uh, but we, and it was leading edge technology, don't laugh, that was the leading edge technology we had back in 1965. Uh, our avionics were a couple of uh, uh, radios that were uh, crystal but pre-digital, if you will, radios and a transponder. Tra we just had started everybody getting transponders, not everybody, but the, the, the well-equipped airplanes had started to get transponders. You don't see any glass in there. You kind of see a six-pack. There's an attitude indicator, but then here's a turn and bank, and then over here is airspeed. There's the, uh, a directional gyro. So not a six pad or not a T pattern, but it was a six, it had all the instruments. So that was the state of the art back in 1965 for you folks that weren't around then. Uh, then I got real lucky. Three years later, actually about a year and a half later after I started flying, I got an interview with United Airlines because uh, the airlines were running out of pilots in the mid 60s. They were actually hiring zero time pilots. I I I trained four or five of them, got them uh, worked them through their commercial instrument ratings, and, the, and then uh, United hired them as pilots. Actually, United told them they would hire them, and went out and got the ratings, came back, United hired them. So they were running out of pilots. So even though I, I had a couple thousand hours by the time I was 19 and a half or so, so I had a lot of time, but I didn't have any college, and I was a baby. You know, I wasn't even 21 yet. But they told me that after putting me through the screening program that they were going to hire me uh, when I turned 21. So uh, I turned 21 and they hired me, and that was in 1968. And I flew all these airplanes either as a second officer, first officer, and or captain over about the 22-year period I flew for United from 68 to uh, 1990. I took an early retirement in 1990 for a lot of reasons, uh, and I, I won't get into all of them here. Uh, you know, some other time it makes the story too long, uh, but there were both pushes and pulls. And uh, I uh, wanted, but the main reason was I had a lot of the things in aviation I wanted to do, and I figured that was, I had to make a decision at that point, either stay for the duration or go out and do the other things. So I, choose to, I chose to go out and do the other things in 1990. Uh, one of the neatest things, though, I did at United, and I had a great time at United for the 12 years before deregulation of the industry, which was, up until, that was in 1980, roughly, and that was when it really took effect. And uh, that first 12 years was, you know, that what you always heard about was the dream airline job, airline pilot job. But then, of course, that changed rapidly after deregulation, and by 1990, you know, it was, it was a lot different job. Uh, but one of the neatest things I got to do while I was with United was to learn how to fly the space shuttle. Uh, I had the opportunity to bring the opportunity to United Airlines to take over the space shuttle from NASA when it completed its orbital flight test period, which should have been in about 1982. And United was interested. That I was uh, uh, assigned the role of uh, assistant, special assistant to the president of United Airlines for space shuttle acquisition, worked that job for about five, six years. Uh, and, and part of that job was to learn how to fly the space shuttle. So I got the, I've got 125 hours in the space shuttle sim. And back then I was probably capable of doing mission training and going out and flying it. But of course, you know, that's been a long time ago now. But it was, that was interesting. Internal Politics United uh, killed the deal. Again, another very interesting story, but it makes this one too long. So we'll put that off for another time. Uh, but as part of that space shuttle experience that I'll get to here in a second, uh, and, and part of my experience while I was at the airlines, just by you know luck of the draw, I my curricular extracurricular activities outside of flying airplanes and doing aviation entrepreneurial things, starting up aviation companies, uh, I uh, uh, got involved with pilot culture change projects. In other words, here's a group of pilots. Their thinking is at A. We, we think we need to have their thinking over here at B for various reasons. Can you move their thinking from A to B? And so the pilot culture change, as I describe it, is simply designing the flight plan that takes you from A to B. Now, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's what it is. So I, I kind of fell into that, you know, that, that line of work, I guess you call it. 
uh, back in 1979 with an, op, uh, an Operation USA, which was a Airline Pilots Association, ELPA, national uh, operations. I was sent up there to run it in Washington, D.C., and I was in my early 30s, 30, 31, something like that. Yeah, I had to be 32 years old at that point. And uh, the, the task was to get all of the ELPA pilots in the U.S., there were about 46,000 of us at that time, to walk off the job for three days to protest the non-resolution of the crew complement issue because uh, some airlines were flying the two-engine jets with two pilots, some were flying with three, and it was causing problems for us among the airline pilots, the different groups, and so we wanted to have a, a, a level playing field across the board, either fly them with two or fly them with three, but fly them uh, with the same number of pilots at all airlines. And, of course, we wanted three for a lot of very good reasons that weren't feather bedding reasons. And the biggest one was training new guys. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the second officer seat at United Airlines, and I learned more about being an airline captain in that seat than I did in the left seat. Because, after all, you're literally sitting at the elbows of the best pilots in the industry and watching how they do it over and over and over again. So uh, that was, I wanted three, but, and most of us at, at ELPA wanted three, but what we wanted more than that specific number was the same number. So uh, we, 90-day uh, program, and at the end of that 90 days, we took a vote, and 85% of the ELPA pilots said, we're going to walk, which was a major culture change, because back then especially, before any big strikes at the airlines or deregulation had taken effect, pilots all thought of themselves as, Management or better, not labor. And walking off the job was not their cup of tea. But uh, we were able to affect that culture change, if you will. I call that culture change or thinking change uh, in a short period of time. Then in uh, 1980, I was asked by ELPA and United Airlines management to do the same kind of culture change, if you will, thinking from A to B thinking among the United pilots. There were about 6,000 of us then. Uh, to, uh, on the first uh, concessionary contract in the airline industry after deregulation of a major, uh, and we were a major, obviously the biggest airline group at the time. So this was pivotal. It was a pivotal, it was a signal to the rest of the industry whether or not we were going to be able to change our thinking from the old, you know, pay us more or we strike, to we'll cooperate with you, but we want to be part of a team. And that's what Blue Skies was all about. And again, it turned out to be, there wasn't really uh, any design to it, but about a 90-day program. And during that 90 days, 85% uh, of the United Pilots, I don't know why that number kept com coming up, but it was the same, 80, right around 85% of the United Pilots voted to take that concessionary contract. Uh, uh, it was a, you know, it was a uh, watershed in the airline piloting game. Uh, we, we took a pay cut. I think it was a 15% pay cut. And we added hours. So it was the first time we'd ever done that sort of thing. So again, culture change. Then in 1981, uh, we, the airlines, United Airlines, which was the, one of the first, if not the first, to move over into what I'm going to describe later for you as Airmanship 2.0 uh, from Airmanship 1.0, made this culture change. And we, we started out with what we called Command Leadership Resource Management Training, CLRM, which evolved to be called CRM training. And then this was at the time when our safety culture was starting to be developed and our safety management system was coming in. So uh, this was a culture change. And I was involved, of course, as a line pilot, being part of that change. But I also helped with how to affect that change because by, of course, this point with these prior two successful programs, I was kind of the go-to guy, United and ELPA, for how do you do this sort of thing. So I participated in that. Then in 83, uh, as part of the Space Shuttle program, United Management and ELPA jointly decided that we needed to have a standalone, not-for-profit, professional organization to select and train the United pilots who were going to make the transition into flying the Space Shuttle. So again, you know, a lot of, that's another story why we did it that way. Uh, but about 1,000 United Airlines pilots, a few pilots from another air, other airlines we let in, later on in the program. It was primarily United Airlines pilots, about a thousand of them, uh, joined up with this organization we put together, American Society of Aerospace Pilots. We call it ASAP. 
and I was the founding national, uh, uh, I'm going to call it, I guess national chairman was my title. I'm going back ways now to remember that. Uh, and uh, we, we went down to NASA. We found out how they train the astronauts, and we set up our own training program to train airline pilots. So very similar to the system that we use to set up to design Airmanship 2.0. We found out what was working someplace, and then we adapted it to our needs. Uh, but this was a culture change among the United Pilots because they had to volunteer to do this, and they actually put money in. We all paid do, uh, monthly dues to support this program, so it was a culture change. For United Pilots, now these are you know, primarily at this point World War II, Korean War, and Vietnam era pilots, thinking that they're going to go off and fly rocket ships. And so it took, well, I had to use the same kind of culture change techniques I used in the prior three programs to make that program work. But inside of just a few months, we went from nobody in that organization to about a thousand pilots in there. Then in 1985, things had really gotten bad at United. Again, another big story. I probably should write a book about this one. Uh, but I was asked to put together this culture change program for the Airline Pilots Association uh, to get the United Airlines pilots unified to strike United because it became apparent to us pilots there, and again, you know, this is our viewpoint, but it, it, I had inside information that I believe that was accurate, that, and, and we all believe that the uh, United Management was going to force us out on strike. There was no way we were going to get an agreement because management had marching orders to break the United Pilots because Lorenzo had just broken the Continental Pilots the year before, and if United had pulled that off, then it would have been all over for the airline pilots back then. It would have been down to real low pay, high working conditions, just like they're at now, <laughs> unfortunately. But, the, you know, we were still fighting the battle. This is early on in the battle back then. So it was do or die. And I was about ready to leave United at this point. I had some businesses going, and I was, I was just hanging around United to make captain because my seniority was moving slowly, That's just the way it was at United. Uh, but the ELPA came to me and said, will you help us to put this together? Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm not a big unionist per se, although I do believe unions have their place. But uh, the, in, in my best, it was in my best interest, the best interest of the group, and I felt the best interest, interest of the industry and the best interest of the flying public that the United Pilots uh, did not get broken on that strike. And, it, and I... My opinion was that if they went out without out doing it, using the process we had been developing to change the culture, that it wasn't going to be a successful strike. So I agreed to do it, and 96% uh, of the United Pilots walked out on the day of the strike, and none of them went back across the picket line. In fact, guys who were flying started coming out, and the strike was ended. Uh, and, uh, so it was very successful. Uh, for the United Pilots. So again, I, I bring it up because it's the same thing we're talking about here. It's culture change among pilots. They can be very successful. Then in 1986, I was asked to come down to the, and do the same thing for the Eastern Pilots. We got them ready to go. They, they voted 96% strike vote, but then Frank Lorenzo came in and saved the day and bought the airline. Uh, yeah, saved the day. But at any rate, they didn't strike. But they, they were a solid group. And so that same process worked. And then in 1999, uh, after I had been an a, a instructor and check airman for flight safety and uh, simulators out in Tucson, after I left uh, flight safety, a group of the instructors there came to me and asked me if I would help them to form a union of uh, instructors at flight safety because they, they really needed it, in my opinion, still do. Uh, so I, I helped, I consulted to the Communications Workers of America, which is a unit of the AFL-CIO, which turned out to be the group that was going to help the flight safety pilots organize. And again, used a lot of these same kind of techniques. Now, that program got aborted. Uh, it worked because the pilots were getting their act, the instructors were getting their act together so well that the management of flight safety threw a lot of money at them and a lot of improved working conditions. And so, therefore, they did not. They decided not to hold the strike ballot. But I would. I my claim is that it worked, and it, I could see the indicators that it was working. That culture change. So, 
Sorry to get so long-winded on all this, but this is crucial to the uh, chances for success of what we're trying to do, which is to change the current culture of personal flyers from Airmanship 1.0 to Airmanship 2.0. And I bring it up to give everybody that gets involved in this confidence that we can do it, because it seems like an impossible task, but it isn't because uh, I've done it before. And as I mentioned, Dave Greenberg has done things like this with large pilot groups. We, we do know how to do it, although it, this is different and new, so we're going to have to you know, create new ways as we go. Uh, so as I get more uh, down in the nitty-gritty of my flying experience, uh, I've been a flight instructor for 45 years now, as I mentioned, starting out in 65, uh, the instruments and airplanes. Uh, I've been an advanced ground instructor for about 13 years, uh, and that's both uh, uh, instrument and advanced. I was an Army helicopter instructor for about eight years, primarily instrument instructing in Army helicopters. And I was a, as I mentioned, Flight Safety International simulator instructor on the Challenger. Uh, also a checker, I and mean, they call them a training center evaluator for about four years. Uh, I'm sorry, three years. I was there for four years altogether. And I was a, uh, I have been a ground and simulator instructor, or a ground and simulator instructor at Glass Simulator out of Aurora Airport now. Uh, and uh, you know, for about, uh, oh, I think about four years, five years now, quite a while, where I've worked primarily with guys who are doing their insurance required uh, annual or recurrent, or they're getting initial training on high-performance singles and twins, and we do that all in the simulator there. Now, as we talk about Airmanship 2.0, we're going to talk about the airplanes you fly, uh, how to afford the airplanes you fly, how to afford the uh, safety systems that went down the engine lanes, and so on. I point out that when I talk about this, these things also back to my experience. Over the years, I've been crazy at the same time. I'm you know, probably too more. These are the ones I can remember. I don't, I don't know. Pretty much always had a plane. Don't have one right now, I'm saying at the moment. Uh, but all kinds of things. For personal condition, for fun flying. So uh, I know buying and selling your ones, what you look at, what you need to consider. Uh, I also have, a, I've been a member of, a, I can remember at least three flying clubs now, uh, where I've flown these kind of airplanes over the years. And, and, you know, I call that, and this is a term being used now, collaborative consumption model of getting your ride. Uh, and, and a part of Airmanship 2.0 is using a collaborative consumption model. So I wanted to present my credentials there when I talk about that later. Uh, you know, I've been there, and, and I, I, I know what, our, what the pluses and negatives are about sharing airplanes. And, you know, that's uh, uh, the plus. Obviously, the first big plus is bringing the cost down. But the first big negative is sharing airplanes. So, you know, uh, but there are ways to get around that. We'll talk about that in, in later briefings. Uh, I've also founded three flight schools and rental operations over the years. And I've founded two operations over the years. Uh, I flew, I was an Army helicopter instructor. Well, while I was with the airlines, I flew the Army National Guard at Midway Airport. In fact, it's one of the conditions when you had to tell Army when I was up for 19 and a half. He said, uh, the job offer will stay open as long as you don't volunteer. For the military, you don't get trapped. Of course, that was the time that Vietnam was splitting up. So uh, I went to find it. In fact, I, you know, because I'm a non-lane generation kind of guy, and I had a bunch of the go-by helicopters for the Army, so they never pretty did. Uh, uh, I knew I put in the Air Force Room, maybe France. But it turned out there, we would take it. Well, uh, the second time I applied, I had well over $1,000 on my commercial certificate. But uh, because I didn't have 20 to 20, they let me in the program. So I, I got the guy who was in school and told me to hire me, uh, was uh, a maintenance technician, uh, and I got the Army Guard at Midway, and he unfortunately got me in the Guard as a, as a uh, Jew Crew Chief slash Drug Guard at my MOS. So I, I, I went through, I went through, mil, I went through maintenance training, I went through drug training, so I'm already trained, especially the maintenance training. And so I'm now flying in the, uh, working in the unit as a Jew Crew Chief and Drug Guard, and we're working out of the line. And in the uh, early 70s, uh, the Army Bureau informed us they were going to deploy to Vietnam as a unit. And so they started equipping and started training them. So they were pilots, so they had the opportunity to go down and get trained up. They didn't have to be 20 per division or 20, 20 per division. And I went out to what they call the first day of the early uh, year. That was uh, kind of a mix. Uh, when I first got in and started flying, I got uh, Korean War Edge stuff, the, the old 23s, the old one bird dogs, the beavers, and the blue canoes, the Cessna U3, Cessna 310. And then when they started getting us ready for Vietnam, they started giving us Hueys, uh, OH 58s, we never called them Kyle, was. And we still had CH-34s from uh, the uh, Korean War uh, era that were being used in Vietnam during uh, the war in Vietnam, and we thought we were going to take them with us too, so we kept them in the unit for quite a while. Finally ended up getting rid of them and being purely Hueys and OH-58s. 
Uh, along the way, just to kind of round things out here, I've been a corporate and or charter pilot for over six years altogether. A couple of them were before I went to work for United, and I was flying Beechcraft Barons Debonairs, which were the precursor to the A36 Bonanza. And uh, the queen of the fleet back then, the top of the line corporate aircraft back then was the Beach D-18s. So uh, the old Sky King airplanes. He had three tenths too, but I think Sky King later on flew that D-18. But at any rate, uh, they, I, those were the type of airplanes used in the corporate and charter world back then, and I flew them in both corporate and charter. Then after I took that early retirement from United Airlines and did a few other things and then went to work for flight safety for about four years as a challenger instructor and check airman, I got antsy again and uh, went out and uh, went back into the corporate and charter flying world where I flew aircraft like uh, the Bombardier Challenger and the Cessna Conquest. And the Cessna Conquest, that was the first turboprop time I ever had. And I really had a good time. Got about $1,200 and had a good time flying the airplane. Uh, and I've been a fast team representative now for a little over a year, giving these webinars and doing other uh, safety-related work for the FAA as a volunteer. I'm the co-author of the book, False Security, The Real Story About Airline Safety. I wrote that book with my wife, who's also a professional-level pilot. As I mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Center for Airmanship Excellence, and I've got somewhere north of 18,000 hours of flying time. I don't really count them too accurately anymore, except for uh, currency uh, and proficiency uh, reasons. Uh, but, you know, I've got a lot of hours, but I've been around a long time. All right. Do we have any uh, questions or comments? We're coming up here to the end of the briefing, but I have just a couple of more things to show you. But at this point, any questions or comments, and I'm opening up all the mics. So if anybody has anything, just go ahead and pipe in. Okay, I guess I got you all worn out. I've muted the mics. Uh, we'll round things out here. I want to give you just a brief history of the Center for Airmanship Excellence to, to close out this package of who we are. It's one thing to tell you our background, I'll show you that we all, most of us have been around quite a while, most of us have been doing things that are right on for what we're doing now. Uh, but I want to tell you how we got here, because there might be wondering, why are you old guys doing this? You know, I'm going to golf to play, I can't just not have a fine line, you know, clip your coupons, whatever it is you old guys do. Uh, I want to tell you how this happened. And I'll begin a very quick story, a uh, long, much longer story at the time going to be here. Well, after I uh, quit the professional last time, in 2002, I didn't do flying for a while. Other things, I got business stuff. I was working on aviation related, but wasn't much flying. And I was, I started getting the itch. And so, in 2005, I had to get up and do some flying. So I joined the flying club here in Chicago area, go named. Uh, no safety culture, no safety management system, no support. Uh, a lot of instructing things. The reason I was instructing, no normal program for training, uh, no support for instructing. Uh, you know, you okay, see, that's how you define. And after uh, a year or two, I said, I'm just I don't like the risk on the airplanes. I don't like the lack of new technology in the airplanes. I don't like the lack of safe devices in the airplanes. Uh, I don't like the lack of safety culture of that. So I said, that's enough. So I, I got out of it. Not too long after I got out of the line, well, my chance I hooked up with glass simulators. Uh, and that's when I come over and do some sim instructing, which I love to do. So I said, work, as I mentioned, primarily with guys who own the airplanes, professional guys, you know, guys, you know, the kind of guys that are flying those airplanes. And uh, they, they had to come in once a year for training because of their insurance and, and or they had to come to the initial before the insurance, the insurance, the insurance new airplane they just bought. So I uh, those guys. And I started seeing things that were very disturbing to me. I'll sum it all up by seeing some they were not proficient. Uh, I saw a few professional guys, charter guys, corporate guys, lines, they did a pretty good job. Also, the guys who ran for them, personal equity and or pleasure, uh, were not proficient they, because they were their flight. They were only doing what they had to do, which at that point was under, come over in a two-day current in the simulator, some gravel too, which is all good. But it might nowhere near enough. And we flight review over here. That's all they had to do. That's all they were doing. Primarily, some a little bit more. But the, it was showing their lack of Christians. I started to think about, oh, this, you know, why aren't guys doing this? I started researching all that. That was 2007. I started talking to Dave Schill, uh, Dave Greenberg, who was on it. When we meet for coffee, he was uh, oh, guys doing knocking trolls anymore. And by 2000, uh, I, I looked at enough of the data, the trends, and so forth, and personal flying. Now, again, if you're uh, arguing, for example, since you're kind of new to the game here, you might not be I'll just touch on briefly. And again, we're, we're almost doing a pretty good, so let's hang in. We'll go a little bit on that, but we won't be much more. Uh, yeah, the, uh, at the peak of the generation, back in the good old days, call them, we had about 136,000 students, actually, 136,000 students this year. Now we have less than 50,000 a year, and about 80,000 never been to our private or sort of project. We had 150,000 act pilots. Now we have less than 600,000 active pilots. We flew over uh, 35 million piston hours a year in the mid-80s. Now we're flying down around 14 piston hours a year. Uh, we average uh, 
were fifty dollars a year. Now we're flying air down around twenty dollars. Uh, so all of you know, we're producing over twenty thousand new single engine pistons a year. Now we're producing under a thousand a year. Now, a good year before the uh, economic crisis in 2007, the generation aircraft industry produced like twenty seven hundred single engine pistons. That's versus twenty thousand. I'd be concerned about us. I said, hey, wait a minute. I want to keep flying. I have airplanes available at a decent price. I want the new airplanes available to me with all of this stuff in it. I want the support structure. I want all this stuff. It looks to me like flying itself is not going to be available in the U.S. much longer. And I believe that. I think that's seriously. But personal flying in the U.S. Be, being so expensive, the infrastructure being so expensive, uh, that none of us are going to be able to do it or want to do it. So I, I became convinced of that a couple of years ago, back in 2000. And I'm that, as you've probably already gotten the impression, I'm one of those guys that says, well, something has to be done. I'll look around for somebody to do it. I'll help them out. If nobody's doing it, say, well, let's go. So uh, in June of last year, just a little over a year ago, uh, I had with Shea, who was my lead safety rep with the AWS program, and uh, other folks, uh, primarily uh, Sam Keeter and Tim Sokol, the AWS program managers for normally uh, uh, Wings program webinars that talked about Ownership 2.0 last year, evolved into that term. Uh, and so in the course of doing some of the webinars, I've talked with over a couple hundred personal flyers in you know, all ranges, new guys guys have been flying for a long time, guys from airplane, guys from air airplane, guys from light rail airplanes before they do very often. We got the whole spectrum. And it means that uh, uh, you know we can do this. There's an interest from the current pilots and there's certainly a lot of interest among you guys to do a range 2.0. So in August of last year we set up the Center for Airmanship Excellence to act as the vehicle like our RBI make this work. And in late 2010, we formalized things by setting up the board advisors. And in early 2011 we set up committees that got to go on air. And uh, between early 2011 and now, which is uh, the end of June, kind of, if you're viewing this later, uh, we've got over 20 CFA volunteers working on the project, and that's growing uh, rapidly. So that's interesting. And because we're running a little longer, I'll skip my questions and comments. I'm sorry uh, about that, but I don't want to take this for an hour. Uh, if you have uh, questions and comments, I'm going to show you how to get in touch with you in a minute. But here are the steps I would recommend you take if this has been at all interest to you so far. I encourage you to go to airmanshipexcellence.org, the website, and register for airmanship updates. There's a button there that says register for airmanship updates. They're free. Uh, just real quick to register and you'll keep you in the loop. We'll let you know about uh, all the other things that are happening uh, with airmanship oil in addition to these uh, Wings Program webinars. These are just the iceberg ones. Also, uh, I encourage you, though, to register for the rest of the webinars in the series. Uh, this, uh, the first three webinars in the series uh, filled up almost immediately when they were not on Stan's email announcement. So you might want to go to the uh, FaceSafety.gov website, and then do the all of the web, webinars that are available. All of five of these webinars in the OSHA 2.0 series, and I suggest that you sign up for the ones that you want to attend out before the emails are out, because it's like it takes some day uh, after when you have to sign out for the uh, for fill-ups. You want to attend, but if you don't get a chance to attend one or more of these webinars and series, no problem, because this webinar is being recorded. We record all and go to the uh, dot org website or the Airmanship Excellence Archives under Airmanship Resources button and uh, find uh, the recording there that you can download from online. So you can maybe be to catch all of these. Uh, also at the website is the uh, section so on Airmanship 2.0, all the briefings I showed you. So if you want to learn everything there is to know right now about Airmanship 2.0, there's a resource right there. Now, when you do uh, get to the point you say, yep, this Airmanship 2.0 is for me. I want to get involved with these guys and do it. Uh, the way for you to apply to participate with us. We're participants to uh, work in the ad side with us, the Airmanship Development Support Organization Demonstrator, but we're selecting. We only want the right guys because we're demonstrating to the rest of the world that it's going to work. And uh, another next step I'd like to ask you to start right now is spreading the word about Airmanship 2.0 because this is only going to work if we all spread the word about it. I'm totally convinced it can work. That's how we used to spread the word about personal flying back in the good old days. There was no advertising to speak of. It was just all of us who were in aviation were talking about it positively all the time. Same thing can work here. We're totally convinced of that. We have about. So if anybody in your world who uh, knows about uh, aviation as an issue, recommend them that they attend these briefings or recommend go to the website start looking at the recordings of the briefings so that you've got somebody to compare notes with. Uh, but Mark, for example, I've hired you to get an instructor to go to the number 2.0 so you can give his take on it. So you get you know, other people's uh, opinion on all this, not just lying from these briefings. Start spreading that word about our midship too. Maybe I want to skip over questions and comments. Well, thank you for spending the time with me in this briefing. Uh, to uh, find out more about Airmanship 2.0. And again, if you have any questions or concern, I invite you to contact me. I want to talk to you about it. Here's a phone number you can use to uh, talk to me. Uh, probably won't answer it. That's our Center for Airmanship Excellence. Uh, so, you know, just leave a voicemail message. I will get back to you. Uh, you can send me an email. 
Uh, again, it's airmanshipexcellence.org and just D. Cook. I spell that K-O-C-H, D. Cook at airmanshipexcellence.org. Or if you forget that, you can go to the airmanshipexcellence.org website, click on the contact button, and you can hook up that way.